The church should be very concerned about what Paul desired for them. This is a, a mercy that not only that, Paul, that the Lord gave Paul uh, to the church as a minister, but that Paul expressed what he desired for them. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful arrangement. Ephesians chapter 4 uh, describes that the uh, gifts that the Lord gave to the church when he ascended up on high, he gave gifts unto men. And he gave in the, these gifts, they were not like things you could put in your pocket or things you could put in the closet or, or things that you could just lay aside. They were, they were ministries that he gave to the church. And so Paul was, was part of that uh, gift that Christ gave when he ascended up on high. And I, uh, it's become more and more apparent to me recently that, that Paul, as a single man, this single man was like one of the larger portions of this gift that Christ gave when he ascended up on high. So the gifts, the gifts don't pass away. Now, Paul left the world. He said, my, the, uh, the, my departure is at hand, he said. And so he left the world, but his ministry didn't leave. His works follow him. And so Paul was a gift given to the church in his day, which is hundreds of years ago now, but he was also given to us. He's a gift given to us. So in this text, what he says, and we desire. Oh, I, I, want, to be, I want to be very, very concerned with what Paul desired for me. Amen. Because this desire came from the Lord, and it's a gift to us. So what a, what a mercy that the Lord has, has arranged things this way and that he has given this type of gift uh, to the church. Now, Jesus sent Paul. Jesus gave Paul. And so we should expect that what Paul does in interest of the church should be a reflection of what Jesus does in interest of his church because Jesus is the one that sent him. So we remember that Jesus, he nourishes and cherishes the church, and so will those whom Jesus sends. Jesus doesn't send anyone who doesn't have the interest of the church in their heart. That's who he sends. And likewise, Jesus said, I desire that they whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. And so Jesus has desire for the church, and so did Paul. Because God, because Jesus sent him, he has, he has the light. He, Jesus, um, Paul shares the desires that Jesus has uh, for, for the church. Not, ju not just because this, he was commanded to do so. That, that's, that's, too low, that's too low of a view. He has uh, the des those desires for the church because, he, because Paul himself is a partaker of Christ. And so as a minister of Christ, then he has the same desires uh, towards the church that Jesus himself has uh, towards the church. And we desire that every one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. This is a great, a great revelation to us, Paul's desire for the church. The, uh, he wrote to the Philippians, he says, we, we long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. Uh -huh. so this wasn't a, a single instance that Paul made his desires known to the church. He also uh, declared the same to the Philippians. We long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. See, this, that kind of thing can only, can only take place in the Lord. He that's joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Mm -hmm. And so when, Paul, when Jesus had desire towards the church, then that desire was manifested in Paul's desire for the church. Mm -hmm. So when Jesus started moving in this direction, then Paul started moving in this direction. Because he was, see, he was a partaker of, of, of Christ. And also to the Romans, Paul said, I long to see you to impart some spiritual gift to you. And then he explained that it was a, uh, to be encouraged by one another. That was the spiritual gift, to be mutually encouraged by one another's faith. But he longed to, to, give, this, uh, to give this gift to the Romans. It wasn't just uh, on, a, on a checklist that Paul was, um, he revisited uh, Paul, uh, Romans in his mind and thought, oh, I, I missed a few things and so I need to go back and so I can check these things off my list. He was a partaker of Christ and so his, his desires were they, were, they were moving and flowing along with Jesus' desires. So he had these strong desires uh, to the church. The desires of the saints for the saints. I'm sure you had some. 
Haven't you not? Have you been you in, in prayer? You, I'm sure, have been moved to desire something for a brother or a sister in the Lord. The desires of the saints for the saints. It all comes from the Lord. He moves the saints towards the saints. He's knitting them together in love. And so he's, he's giving the saints desire for the saints. That's how he ministers to the body. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12 says that he, he tempers the body together. He's tempering it together. He's, he's, in other words, he's, he's, not, uh, uh, he's not joining the, the, body, the members of the body together by uh, nuts and bolts. He's tempering the body together. It's not, we, we don't have impersonal connections. He's tempering the body together. And to the end, this is 2 Corinthians 12, 24, that the members should have the same care one for another. So when Paul says, I, de I desire, we desire this for you, this is not just a, an official position that because I am, the mem I am the pastor and you are the members, I am supposed to say this to you at this point in my ministry. No, he had a desire for them because he was tempered together with these Hebrew believers. He was tempered together so he had the same care for them as, he would, as, as, a, as a man has for his own flesh. He cared for them because they were tempered together. This is an evidence that, that, that you have passed from death unto life because you love the brethren. So as you love the brethren, see, you have desire toward them. It's not a selfish, not a selfish motive. It's not, uh, it's not what you can do for me. It's we love the brethren to, to, to minister to them. We desire, we have godly desires toward the brethren because he that loveth God loveth also him that is, that is begotten of him. So Paul is expressing his sincere uh, God, godly desires towards the brethren in this, uh, in this text. So as he knits our heart together, we've, we read of, uh, we have this instruction of rejoice with them that rejoice and weep with them that weep. That is that's awful hard to do unless you have desire to the brethren. Yeah. If there, if you just, if there's just a an, an official uh, institutional connection between people, you will not be able to rejoice with them that rejoice, and you will not be able to weep with them that weep. But as the bodies tempered together, see, this is weeping with them that weep is not it, it, it is not mechanical. You don't have to be told, hey, you know, if somebody has to has to elbow you and say, you're supposed to weep now because they're weeping. See, something's lacking. Something's, something's out of sorts here. Paul's desire for the, for the believers is a result. Is It's fruit of the Lord tempering Paul together in the body. And when you're tempered together in the body, then you'll find that you, you have a sincere desire for the brethren. Amen. Yes, right. Amen. So as with, uh, see, life begins with parents. That's how the Lord, the Lord, there's only two people that the Lord ever gave in, in this world that he didn't give to parents. Adam and Eve, he, he created as mature adults. Every, every other living person, he gave to parents. And that's where, that's where this starts. It, it, there's a natural affection of the of parents for, for the children. And so we, that's how we begin life, is we are benefited by what somebody else desires. That's how life begins. Yeah. In the flesh. Well, that's how life begins in the spirit, too. That's how, so uh, the, the life of our children is sustained and nourished and cared for because someone else has a desire, a sincere desire for their good. Amen. Yeah. And th that's how life proceeds. Um, we, we marvel, and it's, it's, nothing, it's nothing new because the Holy Spirit commented on it a uh, long time ago about people who are without natural affection. It's just, it's just unnatural for a, uh, for a person to not care for their own offspring. It's unnatural and it's, it's reprehensible. It's actually, it may actually be evidence of a judgment because it's, it's just not natural. The Lord gives affection to those whom you are, uh, to those whom you are knitted, uh, knit to in, in the Lord. Now, Paul told the, uh, so this, this godly, this uh, parental care that had, that begins life, it, this also then extends into 
the life of the body of Christ. We might actually turn that around, turn those tables around and say it the other way. That this care is in the body of Christ and therefore also it's seen in our temporal families as well. It's a spiritual reality that manifests itself in a, in a fleshly reality, in a tangible. Spiritual realities tend to be perceivable in tangible realities. Like in the, the, the changing of seasons when everything, everything dies in the winter and everything comes back in the summer. And see, so that's, see, that's a, like a picture of newness of life. And so that's a, something spiritual that manifests itself in something that's tangible. So the care of the body of Christ for one another is a spiritual reality that also manifests itself in intangible uh, realities. Paul said to the Corinthians that he, they had many instructors in Christ, but had not had many fathers. It's a lot easier to be an instructor and to walk away than it is to be a father. And so that, that sounds rather contemporary, doesn't it? That today there's a lot of people who want to be instructors, but not, there's not so many that want to be fathers. So Paul's, when Paul says, we desire that everyone... See, that's not an instructor speaking. That's a father speaking. We desire that every one of you show. So our, our Heavenly Father does not send contracted ministers. He sends tempered ministers. He doesn't, uh, he doesn't bring in outside help to minister to the body. He brings in inside help to, to, to help the body. The, the, tempered, the, the ministry of, of nourishment and edification is going to come through uh, members that are tempered together. This is, this is how, the, how the body of Christ works. It's um, just a short digression on that point. It, it's become normal today now for, uh, for pastors to kind of make the, make the cycle, you know, make the, to be uh, circulated through this church and that church and this city and that city. And, and they kind of, you know, when the church gets, uh, uh, either a pastor gets done with a church or a church gets done with a pastor, then they just... They just send them on to somebody else and bring in somebody new. And everybody kind of knows that, they, that it's probably not going to last very long. It's, it's the exception for somebody uh, contemporarily to stay at a church at, as, a, as a paid minister for more than three or four years. But this, is, this, is the, this is Babylonian-ish. This is not how the Lord puts his body together. Amen. And we, we should be, this is not normal. We should be alarmed by this, this approach to ministry like a business transaction. Like the people in the, supposedly sit down in the church to hire a minister and it becomes a negotiating table that's more like a business transaction than it is the Lord sending a minister to a church. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> He sends, our Heavenly Father doesn't send contracted ministers. He sends ministers after His own heart. He says that, said this in Jeremiah, I'll give them pastors according to my heart to feed them and to nourish them. Uh, when Paul was sent to the church, he was willing to spend and be spent. This is like one of the, one of the evidences of a, of a pastor being sent from the Lord. They're willing to spend and be, be spent. They la Paul labored in childbirth until... Uh, in birth pains, he said, until Christ be formed in you. See, this was Paul making his desire known for the church. Some have desires for the church, but they're selfish desires. People, there are some who, who seek out the church, seek a, a, a hearing from the church, seek opportunity from the church, but when it, when it all gets shook out, it was for filthy lucre. They really had their own interest in mind and not the interest of the church. And so, see, it's not commendable. It's not necessarily commendable that someone just uh, wants a position of leadership in the church. Because Jude wrote, Jude wrote his letter uh, to a people who that someone had crept in unawares. There were people who had a, had a hidden agenda among the people. And they were taking from the people. They weren't giving to the people. Amen. We are debtors to those who had godly desires for us. It's a good exercise to... Uh, just to, to think back through your, through your life and through your, your walk of faith, through your tenure with the Lord, and to mark, like, like the psalmist says, mark well her bulwarks. Well, mark well those who had a desire towards you. Yeah. And you're debtors to them yeah. who had a desire towards you. And this, see, this is how the Lord works in the body. Is he, Brother Jeremy is very, uh, very regular at mentioning that when he, the Lord answered his desire that the, the Lord gave him a desire for the things of God, and then the Lord answered that desire. Right. See, this is how the Lord 
This is how the Lord works. They have a, uh, it wasn't just uh, a strange circumstance and a strange clash of events that the, that Ethiopian eunuch was reading in the prophet Isaiah, and, and uh, he had questions that, that uh, Philip would just happen to be able to, to answer, and that it, it wasn't just uh, the, 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 the luck of time and chance that the two met up. See, the Lord sent Philip, he made this arrangement, and the Lord was answering the desires of that Ethiopian with the ministry of Philip. That's how the Lord works. He was tempering the body together. We desire. See, this is not, this is not a hireling. John 10, 3, the hirelings have no care for the sheep. It should, be, it should generally be a concern in the churches today that pastors are hired and fired. It should be a concern. That, that the churches say, this is, what, this is what we're looking for. Can you, can you do that for us? And, the, and, and the, it should be a concern that, that uh, so-called pastors say, well, this is, this is what I would like to do, but what is it that you want? And we'll see if we can meet somewhere in the middle. This is not how the Lord works. That's hireling talk. The Lord tempers the body together. Timothy was like-minded, Philippians 2.20. Paul said, I have, I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. Naturally care for your state. It's what Today it would be, uh, I have no man like-minded who naturally upholds the doctrines of the institution. Paul said, who will naturally care for your state. Epaphras who is one of the Colossians, Colossians 4.12, he says, he who is one of you, he fervently labors for you in prayer that you stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. So Epaphras was being tempered to got, together in the body by God and it, that temper was being manifested in the fact that Ephesus had godly desire toward the people he was ministering to. The apostles' prayers are, an ex, are expressions of what, he, of what they desire. For the church, like Ephesians 1, we, uh, we uh, mention these, this prayer in Ephesians 1 regularly in our assemblies, that the, that the God would give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him, that He would enlighten the eyes of your heart that you might know the hope of His calling. That was Paul's desire for the church at Ephesus. Not only at Ephesus, but for the church, for the church at large. He made his desires known, and that makes him making that known like planted Paul's desires in the people that he was praying for. We do not yet know how many deliverances that we have had or how many gro uh, growth spurts that we have had because someone else had a desire for us. And we'll learn those things in the world to come. That'll be one of the, one of the glories of the world to come. Is we'll, and we'll be able to look back and know even as we are known now. And we'll be able to make all these connections. of That, that, that I had that experience because, because of this brother's prayers for me. Because of this sister's labors for me. We'll be able to see all those things, how they all fit together. Well, we need to start looking for them now. We can see, we'll be able to see them now as well. The bre we're debtors to one another because God gives you a desire for them and them a desire for you. It's been mentioned uh, in our assemblies before. It's a wonderful arrangement that he tells you to minister to the brethren and to not be concerned about your own matters. You look out for everybody else's, and then how it works out is everybody else is looking out for yours. And so, see, every, we relieve one another of being selfish. We don't have to be selfish because, every, because my brethren are looking out for me, and so I, I'm anxious for nothing because they're going to be a better judge of my needs than I am. See, we're, we're, uh, man has always been very, very quick to, uh, to, get, to get their own assessment wrong. This is, and so I, I, would, I, would rather, I would rather let you look out for, for my good than me uh, be, cons be overly concerned about, about my, my, myself. See, this is, this is the ministry of the high priest. He went, he went into the holiest of all, uh, and he, he, he did offer for himself first, but then he offered for all the other people. Well, now we're a kingdom of priests. And we, we're, we enter into the holiest of all, not only for ourselves. We are entering for ourselves, yes. But we, we can enter for the brethren. And Paul says, I, I, we desire. Now, when, see, when the Lord gives you desire for the brethren, you want, in some, at some time you want to tell them. Because Paul always did this. He, uh, don't, don't keep their... Um, you don't want to keep all things uh, to yourself. Some things, 
just on a very practical note, some things you don't want to you don't want to tell everybody. You you know that. You know, a fool tells all his heart. So, as Solomon said, a fool tells all of his heart. But you, you do want to be like Joseph in telling people when the Lord gives you a dream. You, want, you do want to make that known. So Paul says, we, we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence. Now, see, there's something, remember what he's already said in Hebrews chapter 6. We desire that every one of you do show the same diligence. Now, then, now insert what he said about the, about the dry ground. Insert what he said about impossible to repent. Insert what he said about learning the principles again. We desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope under the end. So, see, this desire it was not only um, that he wanted them to go on, but this desire was also a concern. We desire that every one of you do show the same diligence. What's he saying? He's saying that they're backsliding. The, the diligence that, they, that he had seen in them, he's not seeing now. The brethren are burdened by your backsliding. Some, sometimes it's good. You know, Paul could speak very frankly. I'm afraid of you. And I want, I want, to, be, uh, I want to be able to, to speak very frankly. I, that's, I appreciate that in Brother Tony. Brother Tony can speak very frankly, and I'm, I'm glad for that. And, and that's not, it's not always pleasant to speak very frankly. But it is good when it's you. Now, this is not something that you want to you want to just glory in. As I, I'm able to speak hard, and I'm, I'm, I'm I really enjoy. You don't want to enjoy that, but you do want to you you want to be able to to speak very frankly. And here here's a frank statement, brethren. The bur- the brethren are burdened by your backsliding. Now I'm you know I'm not accusing any individual right now of backsliding. This is just this is just always true. Brethren are burdened when you draw back. It affects more than yourself. And it affects more than your spouse. And kids, it affects more than your parents. When you backslide, it's a burden to the body. And so when Paul says, I des- we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence, see, there's a, there's a burden underneath that desire. There's, there's a heaviness underneath of it. He said, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. And that's not just, not just when sin broke out, though that, that was a burden to him as well. But daily the care of all the churches came on him. Mm-hmm. The same diligence as the diligence that they had, uh, they had already demonstrated. It had already been seen in them, but now it was waning. Now it was, it was, on, it was like on the downhill. It was diminishing. We desire that every one of you do show the same diligence. Brethren, if your diligence changes, make sure it changes to be more, not less. We desire that you show the same, the same diligence. For, the, for, for your diligence to, di- to diminish, the Spirit has to be quenched. Because the Spirit doesn't... Um, you, you don't See, you really don't have a red line. You understand what I'm... Like, you, you peak out. In, in the flesh, you do. I understand that. You you have a certain limit in the in the flesh, where you can just you can just kind of you can just kind of top out. You know, it's, a, it's just all I can handle. I know there that's that's true in, in some in, in a certain um, in a certain context. That's true. You can just you just kind of redline. But in the spirit, you know, against such things there is no law. And so your see your red line can move in the spirit. It can it can move. It'll move up with you. That's the that's the kind of the uh, that that's the objective of the of the Holy Spirit is to increase your red line. So see, your meter can go up higher then. And so, if if your if your diligence is diminishing, see, then we need to diagnose it. We don't have to know the details. We don't have to know what your weight is to help you to lay it aside. We don't need to know the details. In fact, it, it's, uh, it, it's, it's a good practice to remain general when speaking about the things of the world, but to be very specific when you talk about the things of, of, of God. Okay? So we don't have to know the details, but we do know that if your diligence is diminishing, it's because you're refusing him who's speaking from heaven. Because as you give heed to him who's speaking from heaven, he won't diminish your diligence. It won't happen. Drawing back is a lying testimony. I underline this in my notes. Drawing back is a lying testimony. What does it say? 
for a brother for for a believer who's been delivered from the world to draw back. What does it say? It's a lying testimony. It's saying it could be saying uh, the Lord's hand is too short; it couldn't keep him. It brought him out, but it could see that was wasn't that Moses's concern? If this rep, this you'll get this reputation among the heathen Nathans that the Lord brought him out just to destroy him. Well, the Lord didn't bring you out of sin just to let you go back. Drawing back is a is a lying testimony. It could it could be saying things like see it 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 uh, can be interpreted in different ways. It's why I'm, why I'm uh, throwing out these different scenarios. It could your drawing back could be interpreted as well. The world really is a legitimate competitor with the kingdom of God, and so it got that one back. The world is not a legitimate competitor Amen. with the kingdom of God. It's not. Nevertheless, Philippians 3.16, Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule and let us mind the same thing. Yes, amen. It is, don't give up what you have already got. Don't give back what the Lord has given you. Don't, don't lose hold on what, on what the Lord has delivered to you. Don't get this. See, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Don't give up the progress the Lord has given you because it's reprehensible. And that, that's, what, that's what Paul's getting at in this uh, Hebrews 6.11. We desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto, unto the end. Don't leave your first love. That's what the, the church at Ephesus was rebuked for this. Don't look back from the plow. It'll make you unfit. Don't do it. This is like, drawing back would be like Israel as they progressively took the land of Canaan, the promised land. They went and took Jericho. And then they took, it was with more difficulty, but then they took Ai. And then they went, and they kept progressively going deeper and deeper into the land. And drawing back would be like them saying, oh, we don't, we already took those first two cities years ago. Let them have them back. And just giving cities back. That's drawing back. We are not of them that draw back under perdition, but then, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Didn't Jesus say, He that endures unto the end shall be saved? Mm -hmm. But what of those who don't endure to the end? Well, they're in jeopardy. Yeah. He hasn't left us to be the judge of that. But He did say, He that endures unto the end, He it is that shall be saved. Well, we could say of the others that their love grew cold because they didn't, they didn't endure. Ye did run well. Who did hinder you? This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. Paul spoke very frankly in terms of... You know, I like the, uh, the uh, definition of, of diligence. Sometimes you, you look up um, the, the definition and it kind of it uh, says what you already knew or it says the obvious. Well, I don't, I don't really want to... Uh, uh, waste your time in saying what is what was already obvious when the word was being used. But diligence, that's a, this is a rich word. Same diligence to use speed. That's diligent. It's to use speed. And it, go, it goes on. To be prompt or urgent. To, you, to the same diligence. To be prompt or urgent. In other words, you're not slow to respond. Mm -hmm. Prompt and urgent Haste and eager. It's your e. It's just you know. It's just, you don't have to spell it out for them. You just when the opportunity shows that they're they're prompt, they're 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 hasting to it. They're ur they're urgent in it uh, to be uh, craft, not craft as in crafty, but craft as in uh, a particular, like crafting something, like craftsmanship, or a a wor like workmanship or taking pains. Diligent is, is taking pains with something and, and, and working through something, not being, not being haphazard. In due time, brethren, we shall reap if we faint not. Amen. See, that's diligent. Amen. If, we, if we faint not, continuing un, unto uh, the end. So be diligent to be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless. Now there's a, a relationship here between diligence and the full assurance of hope. It's good to it's good to dig things out of the scripture. Um, not not everything. There there are some things that are just kind of just kind of laid there right in front of you for you to pick up. You can just you can just kind of take it up and and it's just uh, 
It's just very, very accessible for you. Other things, the Lord, does not, the Lord doesn't hand out quite, quite so quickly. You have to, you have to dig, like, you have to like let your nets down into the deep. Okay, and you got to, you got to labor all night in order to catch something like that. You know, so there's a connection between diligence and full assurance of hope. First of all, no man has a monopoly on assurance. That is, you don't, you don't have it so good that you can just kind of take your ease. Not with assurance. Yeah. Not with hope either. It has to be maintained. Slothfulness, neglect, temptation, the old man, this world, they're all enemies of your hope. And they're all enemies of your assurance. And if you're slothful, then you lose your grip. Because you don't have a monopoly on assurance. Then the Hebrews stand as an example of this. We desire that you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. This tells us that Paul has assessed that they have, they have lost, maybe not in totality, but they don't have the full assurance of hope like they used to because their diligence has, has waned. Assurance is only and always found in the company of diligence. Amen. You'll find that where people have the full assurance of hope, they are diligent people. Diligence and full assurance. They're always found together like companions, like David and Jonathan. Just think of assurance and diligence. They, are, they desire each other. They, they long for each other. They, 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 uh, keep, they keep company with one another. Diligence and full assurance. It's like Paul and Silas. Where Paul went, Silas went. He, he, was, he was a laborer with, with Paul. It's like, like Ruth and Naomi. Naomi said, I'm not... I'm not going to leave. I'll go with you. I'll, your people will be my people. Your land will be my land. Your God will be my God. And she went with them. She wouldn't, wouldn't, let, her, wouldn't let her leave. See, diligence and full assurance. That's how they, they, they complement. They minister. They're ministers. They're companions. And so diligence gets away from you. Assurance goes too. You can't keep one and, lo and let the other go. Amen. Keep the same diligence to the, to the full assurance of hope unto the end. So, like diligence is to assurance what Nehemiah was to King Artaxerxes. He was a, he was a minister in his presence. He attended to, he bore the cup. He, when, when, the, when the king needed what uh, Nehemiah would supply what the king needed. And he was, he was in his presence to do so. He was a, he was a minister, first-hand minister. And diligence is like this to our assurance. Amen. Think about hope like the candlestick that had to always be burning. It had to, had to be maintained and had to be kept burning. So the oil had to always be fresh. They, had, they, were, always, they were always working on oil. They were always working on a, on a harvest and, and purifying the oil and, and, uh, and straining the oil and, and crushing and... and uh, it was it was a constant work to always have oil available in that in that candlestick, and that candlestick was to always be burning. Yeah. It wasn't just a matter of lighting it up and um, and get the work done, and then we're we'll we'll do it again tomorrow or in today's day. You know today's terminology would be do it again next week. But for the for the Jews, it was every day. It wasn't it wasn't a weekly thing. It was a daily thing. And so, see, hope had to be, ha, hope has to have a supply of oil. It has to, with diligence, it has to always be, it has to always have a supply in order to continue, uh, continue burning. That, that lamp couldn't burn water. There wasn't any substitutes. It had to be beaten olive oil. It had to be pure oil. Yeah, it couldn't burn sand, and it surely couldn't run dry. So it had to be maintained. Well, kind of like make your calling and election sure. Yeah. See, so it had to be has to be maintained. Like treasure in an earthen vessel. It has to be maintained. Amen. Diligence unto the full assurance of hope. Unto the end. Now here's another example. Think of full assurance like the manna. The manna was it was given to them, but it had to be gathered. See, there's where the, the provision of God dovetails with the labors of men. And see, this is true in the, king, in the, in the New Covenant as well. Uh, the Lord provided the manna, but the people had to go get the manna. They had to, they had to gather it up daily. They had to, some of them only gathered little, but they weren't lacking. Some of them gathered much, but they didn't have too much. 
So their, their labors met with the provision of God, but it had to happen daily. They couldn't gather up one time a week. If they did, they ate one time a week because it couldn't be stored up. There, there were no, no, no assumptions allowed. <clears throat> so late, see, it required uh, uh, diligence. So they had, see, they had to lay hold on the manna like we have to lay hold on eternal life. Right. And it, see, it requires diligence. It requires maintenance to have the to uh, to to enjoy the benefits of the full assurance of hope. You've got to you've got to gather up daily, and you've got to trim the lamp daily. You've got to feed the oil to the lamp daily, in order to have the full assurance of hope unto unto the end. <clears throat> now, lastly. Show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. Among all the truth that is made known in the Scripture, it'd be, it'd be hard to, uh, to itemize or, and to number the things that have been revealed in Scripture that otherwise we would be completely ignorant of. There are so many things that He has revealed to us in the Scripture, but the time of the end, He hasn't. He's kept that to Himself. It's, it was said the secret things uh, belong to the Lord. And he's, he's kept that to himself. When the end will be, he has kept that to himself. The gospel has revealed things kept secret since the foundation of the world, but the time of the end is still kept secret. It's not accessible. Now, there have been many things made known concerning the end. We're not ignorant of, uh, completely ignorant of the end, we're just we just don't know when the end will be. We know what's at the finish line. We just don't know where the finish line is exactly. We know that the destruction of the world will be at the end. We know the day of judgment will come at the end. We know the devil's going to be put away in the end. We know that we shall be changed to be like him at the end. We know that all men will give an account of themselves, what they've done in the body, at the end. See, so we actually know a lot about the end. It's just we don't know when the end will be. Amen. It wouldn't be good for the saints to know when the end will come. Amen. In fact, it wouldn't on a personal level. It wouldn't be good to necessarily for you to know when your end will be. So you have two chances. There's two, different, there's two perspectives. The end can come while we're all still here and alive, or you can come to your end yeah, that's right. and leave us while we're all still here. See, so there's, a, there's two chances, but he hasn't revealed either one. Faith and hope does not depend on knowing when it will come, but that it will come. Faith doesn't have to know when it will come. But faith does have to know that it will come. Yes. Hope doesn't have to know all the details, but hope does need to know what will come. See, that's, that's what's seen in Abraham. Abraham didn't know all the details, but, but yet Abraham believed God, yes. and it was credited on him for righteousness. See, Abraham was, a, was the father of, of faith, and so we, we see those principles mm -hmm. We see those principles uh, lived out in Abraham as that he, he, he got the word, he got the promise, and he believed. He didn't have all the details, but when he did get more details, he believed them too. Mm -hmm. So if you see, this, this, this will preserve you. If you just believe, believe the Lord from the beginning, it delivers you from all kinds of ensuing complication. So what is your life? It's even a vapor that's here for a little bit and then vanishes away. So brethren, we don't have time to be concerned with what hasn't been revealed. You're, you're just a, the next time you pour a cup of hot tea or a cup of coffee or something, just, just try to time. Get your stopwatch out. Time how long the vapor lasts. That's about how long you and I are going to last. See, so when the time comes, really, brethren, it's of very little consequence because we're here just about that long. And the Lord sees the end from the beginning, and we're just, our, our, like Job said, he talked about hand breadth. Our, my days are like a hand breadth. It's just like we're, just, we're really truly in the, the truest sense of visitor. We are visitors in the world. We just come here just for a time. We don't have time to set up. We don't have time to invest. And people who do are just, they're just deceiving themselves. We're here but for just a little bit of time. And so we can't concern ourselves with unconcernable issues. We've got to concern ourselves with being diligent under the full assurance of hope unto the end. And the end, um, the Jacob, when he answered Pharaoh, he Israel 
answered Pharaoh. He said, my, my days have been few. He was an old man. My life has been, has been few. It's been short. And what a, what a mercy that is. All flesh is as grass, not mountains. See, the mountain, as the mountain sits there, it sees grass come and go. Same mountain. Grass comes, grass goes. Grass comes, grass goes. See, the, it's like how many, how many seasons of grass has Mount Everest seen? Well, we, we don't know, but Mount Everest is still there. Yeah. Yeah. See, all flesh is like grass. It's here one day, and, it, and, it's, and it's gone. It's gone the next. Yeah. Amen. Unto the end. <clears throat> now, you could view the end in, in uh, two other perspectives. You could, if the legalist views the end as you have to do this all the way to the end. You can't ever stop. You can't deviate. You can't be unfaithful. You have to do it this way all the way to the end. And then that makes, that makes things look really long. Mm -hmm. Or you could view it like this. I only, have to, I only have these liabilities till the end. Then they're gone. I'll only have these enemies till the end. Then they're gone. I only have to fight till the end. Then it's gone. That's right. See, it really changes things, yeah. doesn't it? To, to look at things from the underneath up really looks different than looking at them from the top down. Yeah, that's right. Really, really do, we really want to have the top down perspective on things. So you, you want to view the end as, as in, in this way, that the good fight of faith will come to an end. Yeah. The enemy of our souls has an end. That's right, amen. You want to view the end as time itself is going to have an end. Yes. The world will end. Your flesh will end. Mm -hmm. Knowing in part is going to come to an end. Mm -hmm. It's just for a time. Seeing in a glass darkly will end. Finding another law in your members will end. It all, it, it's all going to come to an end. Mm -hmm. Being perplexed will end. Being cast down will end. Mm -hmm. It's all going to come to an end, yep. and then things get better. Keep the, be diligent under the full assurance of hope mm -hmm. unto the end. Yes. And your, your end may, might be just a few breaths away. Yeah. The end may be closer than all of us mm -hmm. ever dared to imagine. Yeah. Yes. And see, this, this, this kind of talk, see, hope thrives in this yeah. This, in this, this kind of talk. The yeah. end, the end is coming. Yeah. You can't just say that to everyone. You say that to the next person in line at Walmart, and you might, you might just faint over dead. <laughs> the end yeah. is just around the corner. Right. And people either argue or scoff or all kinds of reactions. But you say that, you say that among the brethren, and th these are words of hope. Yeah. The yeah. end yeah. is just around yeah. the corner. Yeah. The yeah. In, Peter said it this way. The end of all things is at hand. Yeah. It is. It's close. The end of all things is at hand. So, if any man keeps my works unto the end, then the promises are yours. Hope to the end for the grace yeah. that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of, of Jesus Christ. He shall confirm you unto the end to be blameless. He that endures unto the end shall be saved. A start without an end is like a race without a prize. Yeah. Nobody's going to start. That's right. See that... Babylon robs people of the end. It, it, it makes people looking at, look at their feet instead of looking at the, looking at the finish. Looking at the end. Beginning but not finishing is like giving birth and never nourishing. These things ought not to be. So faith is very concerned with the end. And faith is not content with just the present. Never has been. Faith is what... Faith is what makes you an otherworldling yeah. because it's concerned about the end more than about the present. Mm -hmm. So I exhort you in wrapping these things up, <clears throat> I exhort you to see, to see Paul's heart in this and how he, how he addresses these brethren. He sees, he sees the brethren in a dangerous circumstance. Mm -hmm. And so he, he admonishes them about the end. See, some people would just, would just want to bring, bring the hammer down and just say, you, you people are very disappointing and you ought to be ashamed of yourselves, and you know better, and all, all, kinds of, all kinds of words like this. But the Holy Spirit moved Paul to address these brethren that were, they were in a dangerous circumstance, but he, he moved them to address them about the end. So remind, yes. remind people of, of the end. So I, I exhort you to look for the end, yeah. and to hope for the end, and to think about the end, 
and live for the end. Mm -hmm. that, that's what sanctifies the day, is when you live for the end, mm -hmm. for the end of all these things. And I, I, I exhort you to tell the brethren about the end. Tell me about the end. See, that, that's how we minister to one another, is to talk about the end. Tell people about the end and pray unto the end. And as, as Paul said in this text, be diligent unto the end. That, that's, when it all, yeah, that's when it all pays off. You won't, you won't be disappointed in the end because you were diligent. You won't be disappointed in the end because you, you considered Jesus. You won't, be you won't be disappointed in the end because you cast all your care upon him. You won't be See, you want to be able to think like this. You want the end to be able to set the tone for today. When the end sets the tone for today, see, then it doesn't matter when the end comes. The end can come day. The end can, when the end sanctifies your day, then you're ready. Amen. Then you're, you're ready for it to be, to be the end. So I'm, I'm grateful for that perspective, and I'm grateful that Paul was so quick to tell us of his desires for, for, for the brethren. It's a very, very, very good word. Amen. Amen.